Father, we just thank you for the birth of your son. God, we thank you that you sent your beloved son, Jesus, God, to, to die for us. Father, how important it is, God. How much we needed it, God. Way more than we ever even realize it, Lord. Father, we just thank you for this time. Father, I ask you, God, that you would, Father, use me as a, as a vessel this morning, God, to bless and encourage, God, your people. To bless and encourage your sons and daughters today. Father, I'm asking, God, that you would, Father, be here in your fullness today. Holy Spirit, come in your fullness. Come in your power. Move over our hearts. Breathe life on our hearts today. Breathe life on our hearts today. Bring us deeper into knowing you. Bring us deeper into seeing you. Father, we love you. Have your way today. In Jesus' name. Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So the way that we would say Merry Christmas in Hebrew right now in, in Israel, the believers in Yeshua, which aren't, they're outnumbered, obviously. So Orthodox Jews would be running around saying this. Yeah. Is Hak Malad Sameach. Can you say it? Hak Malad Sameach. And it means happy festival of birth. Right? They, a lot of, they wouldn't know what a Merry Christmas was. If we were to talk to the first church, they were Merry Christmas. What is that, right? But that's good. Now, you know, I mean, I know most of us, I'm guessing, probably know at this moment in time that December 25th wasn't Jesus' birthday. Right? Does everybody know that? It's not shocking. He wasn't born in December. You know, prophetically, and and um, a lot of a lot of uh, theological scholars would probably say that he was born more during the Feast of Tabernacles, which we celebrated in October, sometimes in September. You know, it's the Feast of Booze, Sukkot, and you know the Lord gave us this feast to celebrate as He was a covering and a. Um, a place, you know, we, 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 we recognize that when Israel was in the wilderness, the reason they celebrate Sukkot is when Israel was in the wilderness that he covered them. He was their protection. He was their food. He was their, you know, he kept them, right? He kept them and he covered them. It's the Feast of Booze, the tabernacle. The tabernacle was given to Moses, a blueprint. And it was a portable um, sanctuary for the Lord's dwelling. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But Christmas, you know, I know uh, this is a Messianic congregation, you know, where we, we appreciate our Hebraic roots of our faith. And, and I, so when I came to faith in the Lord, as I've shared, many of you know, I, I worked for Discovery of Jewish Jesus. I actually was really blessed to come, in, you know, to come into relationship with Yeshua through that ministry. But when so when me and my wife began to read the Bible, we started in Genesis, and then we read, you know, through and, to, and from cover to cover. It was the way we approached it. For some reason, it was given to us that way, right? It didn't start in the Gospel of Matthew. It started in Genesis. So that's where we that's where we started it. You know, started reading this Bible, and you know, I like many others, I began to hear, oh well, you know, this. This holiday Christmas is like, you know, steeped in pagan roots and, and you know, all this stuff, right? I mean, a lot of us, I'm sure, have heard this, right? I'm, I'm assuming. And, you know, that this wasn't the actual day of his birth and I allowed all that stuff to affect my mind and, and get to me. And I threw my Christmas tree out and was like, we're not celebrating Christmas. You know, I'm not doing it. And I, I still choose not to have a Christmas tree. But I certainly don't, you know, condemn anybody that does. It's a beautiful thing. Because I think for most of us believers, the reason that we're celebrating Christmas is the birth of the Messiah. Amen. Right? That's Amen. why we're celebrating. That's what our minds are focused on. And I know the world, you know, has taken it and turned it into what it was never meant to be. You know, right? Mm -hmm. And what in our hearts, it's not 
supposed to be. And that's what we're here this morning. You know, right? We're here to, to, to celebrate the birth of a Messiah. You know, the wise men came from a great distance following the star in the sky to celebrate the birth of the Messiah, the King. And if they did it, right, we should do it as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Celebrating the birth of our Messiah is very special. The incarnation of Yeshua, the incarnation of God into flesh. Man, right? There's like so much there. There's so much needed there, so much beauty there. We're just thankful for that. You know, I think of, uh, you know, as I was kind of sharing myself that I, I come to this understanding and realization concerning the roots of Christmas and, and all the stuff that you hear and, uh, you know, went extreme. And, and a lot of people do that. And a lot of people do that with like the Sabbath, with Shabbat. They come and they find out that, wait a minute, Shabbat isn't on Sunday. Shabbat's on Saturday. Well, I can't come to church on Sunday anymore because it's just Shabbat's on Saturday. And there's people that, that have that viewpoint. Obviously, you guys aren't them because you're here today. And I've never quite understood what that even has to do with anything. Quite honestly, the Shabbat has nothing to do with like when you should worship the Lord. Because if we go to Acts chapter 2, we find the first church, they were in, in the temple every day. They were there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbat on Saturday, and on Sunday. Every single day, right Michelle? They were there all the time. So it's always good to worship the Lord. The Shabbat is, like I said, it's separate from, separate from coming to services. It's not the same thing. So it's good to celebrate, even though the day is off a little bit, right? The day of the birth of our Messiah is off. It's not December 25th. It's a really good thing to celebrate this day. Amen. It's, a, it's a really good thing to celebrate this time. It's a good thing to celebrate the incarnation of Yeshua because without it, God's ultimate plan would not be accomplished. Let's see if I can figure this thing out. So it's a worthy celebration, right? So what we're doing this morning, what families around the world are doing, coming together, celebrating the birth of Messiah, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful, worthy thing. Unfortunately, not everybody is celebrating the birth of the Messiah. Like, even, yeah, the last family gathering that I, that I was invited to on, on my half of the family, I, you know, stood up before we ate dinner and asked if I could pray. And I prayed and, and I shared, you know, like explicitly why we were here to celebrate the birth of the Messiah. And unfortunately, I wasn't invited back again. That was some time ago. And uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, when we lift up the reality and truth to some people, they don't, they don't understand. They're just doing it because it's what they've always done. Right? For some people, it's actually more about getting together as family than it is about the birth of the Messiah. And that's okay. I mean, that's why there's a lot of people that aren't here this morning. It's because, you know, and I pray in their family gathering that they're not holding back their tongue and pronouncing the, the reality and the why, why we're doing what we're doing today. You know, I pray that that's not the, the case. If we could stand for the for the reading of the word here for just one moment. In the incarnation, Hebrew prophecy is fulfilled. In the incarnation, Hebrew prophecy is fulfilled. When you realize that there were different men at different times, even thousands of years apart from one another, continents apart from one another that wrote about the same thing and they said okay this is going to happen in this time and then you see the fulfillment of it it's like really amazing this is all the way back in Genesis all the way back even in creation we can begin to see the good news the, the prophesied birth of Yeshua the prophesied birth of the Messiah we can even see it right after the fall of man 
right? The Lord says uh, in your seed, he's you know, speaking to Eve that I'm going to send one. And yeah, he's going to like, the, the devil, the adversary is going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise his head, right? He's going to break through. I'm going to send this one. And then again to, to Abraham, it's prophesied. Abraham was the first Hebrew, the first one to cross over. Hebrew means one that crossed over. One that heard God's voice and, and, and followed it. He crossed over. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Please be seated. Thank you, Abraham, for hearing the Lord's voice and obeying. Amen. Right? Amen. Thank you, Father, that you called him and you drew him. Because the reality of it is, is it wasn't even Abraham that, that it, it was God who revealed himself to Abraham, right? It wasn't even Abraham's doing. It was actually God revealed himself to Abraham and gave Abraham the grace and the strength and the ear to hear. And he responded to it. And I know there's like this thing where, you know, we hear the Lord's voice and we have to respond to it. But at the end of the day, it was actually God who who gave us the ability Amen. in His grace to respond to His call and to respond to His voice. But yet we still have to respond and be obedient. It's a, it's a mystery, right? It's a great mystery. Well, let's look and see how this particular uh, um, prophecy was fulfilled, right? So we can go back and we can prove, you know, the very first thing, now, we, now we'll get to the book of Matthew, and the very first thing that Matthew does is show us that Yeshua, that Jesus was the son of Abraham. He was the seed that was prophesied about. He was the one that the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, through your seed. So this is what Matthew does, the record of the genealogy of Yeshua the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So he takes us right away, right? Right right away, the Gospel of Matthew, the very first verse, the very first line in what we would call the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, is establishing that Jesus, that Yeshua was the son of Abraham. He was the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah that was prophesied to come. Without this birth, without this incarnation, there would have been no fulfillment of the prophecy. And we are the nations right here I don't know if you're aware of that I'm sure most of us in here are not Jewish we're Gentile and we are the fulfillment and proof of this prophetic prophecy this release and declaration from the Lord to Abraham we're the proof of it right now that through his son through his seed through Abraham's seed singular seed he said through the one seed in Galatians Paul said he didn't say plural seeds he said one seed through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And here we are this morning. Yeshua, again, proving he's this one that fulfilled the Hebrew prophecies. Again, he was this Jewish man, born of a Jew, born, born in a Jewish family, right? So this is the account in Luke of, of Yeshua being brought to the temple to be, uh, to be dedicated and to be circumcised on the eighth day. That's part of this, uh, um, part of the covenant that was given to Abraham was the covenant of circumcision. And now all of your, all, all of your people will be circumcised on the eighth day. So here they, here Mary and Joseph, Joseph and Mary bring their baby son to the temple to follow the prescribed law that's in the Torah, the prescribed instruction that's in the Torah that you will that your son will be dedicated, the first of the womb will be dedicated as a priest of the Lord, will be dedicated unto the Lord, and that he'll be circumcised on the eighth day. And there's this one, uh, Simeon, who says, he's, he starts to prophesy, he starts to talk about the prophecy that he had heard, over the, heard from the Lord, and he starts to speak this reality and truth of Yeshua over him and to his parents. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared, right, in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Hallelujah. Here we are today because he is a light to the Gentiles. We know him. We've seen him. He's shown himself to us. 
And here we are, again, a fulfillment of this prophecy. In the, in the incarnation, Hebrew prophecy is fulfilled. Again, we can see in prophecy, it prophesied where he was going to be born and that he was going to be God. That he, where he was going to be born, and like, how can this be? And Micah, this is a thousand years, you know, 600 years before Jesus' birth, this man knows where he's going to be born and who, he's, who he is. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. I mean, he comes from nowhere. Bethlehem, this little tiny place, this little tiny village. I was just there recently, and it's not it's uh, much much larger now than it, than it was then. Then it, you didn't even know where it was. It wasn't even on the on the map. From you, one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Where he's from, Bethlehem, and that he'd be from the days of eternity. That he would be God himself. That he would be God in the flesh. Where is it? Where is it stated in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be God? Right here in Micah chapter two, that he would be God himself. We can see this fulfillment in Matthew chapter two. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of Herod the king, it tells us right where Jesus was born. Right? I mean, this Bible is a historical document. It's more sure than most historical documents from its time frame. There are more recordings and more uh, of the more, more original pieces from it than almost any other historical document of its time. Hmm. There we go. Again, we can see the fulfillment that he was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. I love this. This is kind of a side note. This Word, a lot of us know the Word, right? The Word is called Logos in the original Greek. A lot of you, are you familiar with that? Logos in the original Greek. Here's a really neat thing that maybe you don't know. Maybe you do know this. So we have like meteorology, psychology, all of these ologies. The root word of that is logos. All of these, it's the study of, it's the understanding of, right? But here's the beautiful thing, because this is the season, right? And you hear everybody say, oh, remember the reason for the season. So this word logos in its original form actually means the reason. Isn't that interesting, right? Yeah. He is the reason. He's the reason for everything. He's the reason for this season. He's the reason why we're, why we're celebrating his birth today. And here's a very interesting thing. When John wrote this, the same culture of the Greeks was like, was strong in Israel. And it was strong amongst the Jewish people. It was strong. I mean, look at our, look at where we're at today. You walk through Washington, D.C. You go downtown Toledo to all of our courthouses and all of, most of our governmental buildings. And they, what culture has perpetuated our, our, our culture, civilization, Greek culture? You go to Washington, D.C. and you see monuments and all of these things that are built exactly like the Greeks pillars and right so like it's so ingrained in our culture so john was actually coming against those who said you know what because in the greek mind we had to separate god from his like he couldn't physical the physical had nothing good in it the spiritual was here and the physical was here so john was literally combating the idea that god that that jesus couldn't be fully god he was combating the idea here when he wrote this very specifically saying, look, I know you guys are talking about this demigod, this not fully God and not fully man, but he's like this weird thing that God created because he couldn't actually touch his creation. And this was John actually coming straight against that, saying, no, the word was God. 
Right? The Word was God. And then He came and He dwelt among us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a good thing to celebrate the incarnation of Yeshua because without it, God's ultimate plan would not have been accomplished. By fulfilling the prophecy contained in the Hebrew Scriptures, Yeshua completed the requirements and established God's covenant. The incarnation, in the incarnation, the Lord's covenants are established. He established the new covenant in His body. And we can see again, hundreds of years before He came, this new covenant was prophesied about. Jeremiah chapter 31, 33 through 33. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day. I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband of them, declares the Lord. I am going to make a new covenant. I am going to make a new covenant with them. And it won't be like the old covenant. It'll be different. Even though I was leading them through the hand, leading them by the hand, I'm going to make a better one. And this is Luke chapter 22. This is Yeshua fulfilling this covenant in his own body. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying, this is the cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He fulfilled it in his own blood. One person's excited about that. <laughs> Amen. He fulfilled it in his own body. And again, we can see this in Ezekiel. Right? Because Yeshua... Here's the beautiful thing, right? Because Yeshua went to the Father, because He came incarnate in flesh fully God and fully man, and he went to the Father, the Father sent the Spirit. And now because you have the Spirit, you can walk according to this new covenant. Now you can walk according to the way that he always meant for us to walk. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, right? What does this mean? A heart of I'll move this heart of flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart, a tender heart, a new heart. I'm going to do it in you. I'm going to give you a new spirit. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. I'm going to put my spirit in you, and I'm going to cause you. To walk rightly. Before I gave a covenant to my people that said, if you do this, if you walk this way, if you do this thing, if you do this, if you abstain from this, if you do this, then I'll bless you. But I'm giving you a new covenant. I made a new covenant that's not like that one. And now I'm going to put my spirit within you. I'm going to do it. You're not going to have to do anything but receive it. And then you're going to be able to walk according to my ordinances because I'm going to do this for you. We see the fulfillment of this. John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. He's going to teach. He's teaching us in all things. He's teaching us day by day how to walk this out, right? He's teaching us day by day. It, without the incarnation, without Jesus coming and dying on the cross, being born of a virgin, and walking a sinless, perfect life, and being, being nailed to a cross for us, being buried and raised up on the third day, and ascending to the Father, we wouldn't have the help or we wouldn't have the Holy Spirit. And we would be here today, just like those of old. We'd be orphans. We would be without a shepherd. We would be without direction. Right? The Father would be among us, but He would not be in us. Oh, He's in us, guys. Right? Because of this incarnation, He's not just with us, but He's in us. He's not just with us, but He's in us. He established it through Himself. Amen. 
I love what Peter says here in 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, I love this, has caused us to be born again. Amen. Noah, he caused you to be born again. Come on, right? He did it. You didn't do anything. He just one day, actually before he even created the world, before the foundation of the world, he said, Noah, you're mine. I'm going to seal you with my spirit. I'm going to do it in you. To each and every one of us. Praise God. Amen. Even as the Garden of Eden, even as in the Garden of Eden, God's plan and purpose was always to dwell with us in a special way. Even in the Garden of Eden, God Eden, we would say in Hebrew, the Garden of Eden, his plan was to dwell with us, right? In a special way. In the, in the incarnation, God's purpose is settled. His purpose was settled in the incarnation. Look, this is what God said in the creation story. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Why would he create us in his own image? So we can have a relationship with them. We can have a relationship with our dog, but not in the same way that I can have it with my wife. We can have a relationship with all kinds of other things, right? But not in the same way that we can have with each other. I can't have the same relationship, Michelle, with, with a cow that I can have with you, right? We can express ourselves to one another. We can know each other. We can share our thoughts and our feelings. Right? And that's what God, that's why God made you like Him, is because His heart is to know you and for you to know Him. Amen. Amen. For you to, to, to dwell with you. Right? He wanted to dwell with Adam and Eve, but oh, even better. Even better than Adam and Eve, He dwells in you. He longs to be with us all the time. Look at this. We've talked about this just the other night. So this is after this is after the Lord gives gives Moses a, a very detailed blueprint, very detailed blueprint of the tabernacle. I talked about this tabernacle a moment ago, right? This portable sanctuary that they would take with them. He gave them very detailed instructions. I want the furniture to be like this. And I want this to be like this. And I want this section to be here. And that section to be there. And that section to be there. Why? That I may dwell with them. Why did he want them to go through that? Why, why so many sacrifices? Why so many lambs and animals and blood? And all this stuff. Because he wanted to dwell with us. Because he wanted to dwell with them. That's why. That's always his heart. His, his heart was always to be with us. To dwell with us. That's his purpose and his plan. That's his great purpose for us. Is that he would dwell with us. In the book of Hebrews it says that Jesus, that Yeshua was a shadow. That All, all of these things... The tabernacle and the, the, all of this stuff was just a shadow of Yeshua, the one to come. So I want to, we take a step back for a minute. I'm not going to pull it up here. But we go back to John chapter 1, verse 14. There's a very, very specific word there. It says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt among us means tabernacled. It means pitched a tent. So here the Lord sends the more perfect tabernacle. The more perfect tent. To do the more perfect thing. That we can dwell with Him fully. If, he wouldn't have, if there wouldn't have been the incarnation. If He wouldn't have sent His perfect tabernacle. His perfect Son. Right? The one not made of human hands. We wouldn't have the same intimacy and closeness with Him. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this creation. 
And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having attained eternal redemption. Hallelujah. Come on. Without this perfect thing, you guys are sitting here like, I don't know if you heard me. I'm not sure if you heard me or not. Eternal redemption. Amen. You guys were bought. You guys were bought with a price. You guys were paid for with a price. Redemption. Redeemed. Do you know what that means? You were slaves and your freedom was bought. Right. Your freedom was bought back and you're no longer a slave. And without this perfect incarnation, without, the, without Yeshua becoming fully God and fully man, this wouldn't have happened. Well, the incarnation is worthy to be celebrated. It's worthy to be celebrated. Yeshua joined deity and humanity in his body. He joined deity, fully God, and humanity, fully man in one body. There's this thing called hypostatic union. And that's the merging completely and fully of God and man. We can, we can see that expressed when, in Hebrews when it says he was the exact image, the express image of the Father. He first and only brought finally fully God and fully man in one place. And he walked in a way to where, he, where we could experience God completely. And God could experience us completely. He joined us together perfectly and wholly, right? Through the perfect tabernacle. He came and pitched a tent and walked among us. So that we could enter into this tent completely and fully, right? In Christ you are these things, right? In Christ you are. In, in God's love, right? In Christ Jesus. It's in Him, in this perfect tabernacle. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation, that's a big fancy word. It means payment for our sin. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted and that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. He knows exactly how you feel, completely, wholly, and totally. He knows when you're hurting right now. He knows when you're happy right now. He experienced it all upon himself, and he brought it to the Father. He knows when you've been tempted. He knows those of us who are addicted to certain things. He knows our weaknesses and our flaws and all of it. But he did it perfectly. And he was able to merge us completely and totally with God in his body, in his, in his birth. He was able to join the two of us to one, which was God's plan for us all along, is that we would be together completely and fully. Not in separation, but totally. He's placed his spirit in us through this incarnation. He's redeemed us through this incarnation. He fulfilled the scriptures that were written about in this incarnation. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, right? He's passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. He walked it out perfectly. In, in a human body, he did it. He did it. To sh he did it for the Father to show the Father to to be able to relate us to God to the Father, and he did it for you as well, because he walked it out, and then he sent his Spirit. Now his Spirit's in you, and now you're in him. And now because you're in him, and his Spirit's in you, he's in you, and you're in him. You can actually resist temptation and resist sin as well. Amen. You can overcome it all. We can walk free from it, right? No longer bound to sin and death. Amen. To the law of sin. But to the law of the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. It's a worthy thing to celebrate the incarnation of our Lord. 
Through him, he's brought us completely and fully together as a family. We can know him well. We can know him completely. Well, Father, we just thank you, God. We thank you for this. We thank you what you've done through the Messiah. We thank you for the birth of your beloved son, for the birth of Yeshua today. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. God, that you so loved us that you gave your only begotten son, Father, to die for us. That you made it easy, God, that you did it. That you made the covenant, God, and that you fulfilled it through your son. That you did it all. Father, we just thank you today for your son. Thank you for the birth of Yeshua today. God, we bless you. We bless you. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I just want to sing this blessing over you. I encourage you to stand and receive it today. face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift you up with his countenance and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. <laughs>